really starting to piss me off lately. I'm starting to get really frustrated with not only the way that women are treated, but the quality of artwork and <laughs> the way that women might get into shows or the way that men think that women might get into shows. It's all just a little ridiculous. I recently met up with Lindsay Buckman, a young artist who lives and works in Los Angeles, to get her insight onto what it's like being a young female coming up in today's L.A. art scene. And I really love her work. Being a female definitely has a bias. I mean, it's like, oh, that's, uh, they look at the work, right? This, is, this happened to me a lot when I was younger. People would look at my work and say, oh, whose work is this? And I'd be in the room and I would say it was my work. And it's like, oh, I thought this was a man's work. And I remember thinking like, well, does that mean you take me more seriously because I'm a man? Or does that mean that it's no longer valid because I'm a woman? And this started when I was 20. I had someone say to me in my undergraduate degree that they, they were like, you know, be careful with how much, I was starting to go into this like really white neutral palette and it was starting to just become apparent on their work and they said, be careful with that because there are many women artists who make that type of work. And I, I kind of just like wrote it off at first. I'm like, that's not a big deal. What are you talking about? Like, this is what I'm interested in making right now. And then I started doing more research about women who were making that type of work and they were all the women artists that I really admired. It's like, huh, that's strange. And yet they've had much acclaim. It's not that you can't be successful doing that. I yeah. just think that there's this idea where it's, it's predictable that women would make soft, ethereal, sort of um, emotional work. This project has really become a kind of investigation for me uh, in trying to decipher and understand the art world as it is. In part, because it's kind of like a strange and shiny puzzle I want to solve, but I also really want to help because it's really hard to navigate on your own. And new artists are struggling, and <laughs> it's painful to watch. <laughs> um, when an artist is first trying to get the career off the ground, they want as much exposure as possible. And that includes showing your work at non-traditional spaces, creating commissions, doing pet portraits, taking commercial assignments, community projects, anything to make a name for themselves and make a living. The art museum, is a far-off dream for some. The White Cube Gallery seems slightly more reachable, but is also pretty difficult to get right off the bat. But the small community spaces, the yoga studios, the cafes, the art gallery slash retail shop, might be more easily attainable. The art world is an elitist, judgmental, strange place, and there are definitely stigmas attached to each different kind of art space. Like Tulsa, Shayna, and Lindsay, and McColl all said, you just always have to say yes early on in your career. Getting your work out there is more important than being judgmental before you need to be. For a personal experience and the rewarding aspect of it, that I prefer to be in either nonprofit spaces or alternative spaces hmm. where you're working directly with them and you have more freedom as to what you can do with your creativity. Interesting. Yeah, that's been a, that was kind of like eye-opening this year. That's really interesting. So the Namaste Gallery in Highland Park, that's also a yoga studio, right? It is. I've been there a couple of times. They always have really good art. They do, But yeah. there's always something about it where you're like, it's still a yoga studio. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. I think that that is a huge aspect of what happens uh, in alternative spaces. Yeah. So people don't take them seriously. I loved meeting Shayna and talking with her about everything that she does. I, she's, it's literally like looking to a mirror of my life in the future. That's awesome. And it's pretty fun. Like, she's really well respected as an art critic. Um, she writes for major publications, um, Art Limited being one of her bigger ones, and Huffington Post, and LA Weekly, and, but she's written for a million. Um, way more than me, <laughs> which is saying something. <laughs> But she's she's crass and she's wry and and funny and charming and adorable. It's it was just a really fun time. Um, she's definitely she's definitely a strong supporter of the project that we're doing, which was so refreshing to hear, like right off the bat. Um, but she also had some really interesting viewpoints on like the life of a writer. There were a lot of years 
um, where I wrote for sort of what became kind of the last hurrah of print media, where I was in um, Tame and Celeste and Modern Painters and Art Review and, you know, Art Week, which then was still a print magazine based in the Bay Area. Um, and although it came out every month, it was called Art Week, but uh, whatever. <laughs> and it's fine, you know, nobody seems to mind. And, you know, I wrote for a lot of that kind of print stuff, and then I had this online thing happening with Flavor Pill, and then that gradually started shifting. And then, um, but then, I, you know, again, my timing was kind of lucky because when finally everybody caught up and realized that online was happening, I had already been doing it for a while, and I had kind of a reputation and a name, a little enough of a name in print that I was able to kind of get on like that early train of people paid to do things online. It's been pretty difficult for me lately to find balance um, between all of my endeavors, but I think I usually take that for granted because I don't really have much else to balance other than work. But lately, I have a new relationship, and that's becoming important to me. Um, and my career is, of course, super important to me, but finding that particular balance is, is proving to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. Um, I certainly couldn't imagine if I needed to put children into the mix, I feel like I would be way overwhelmed. Um, so more props to Ingrid for being able to do marriage, career, and kid. Um, obviously, she hasn't had as much time to spend toward her career as maybe I have, but it's really hard. I'm still figuring it out. I'm losing a lot of sleep in the process. <laughs> I, I can't speak to you. Um the sort of soul searching that goes into choices like right. that but I am pretty sure that I would be miserable and um, <laughs> just on so many levels like the combination of like doing less well in my career and probably feeling some kind of resentment for the poor little darling due to it being all their fault or something <laughs> like I just can only like no good no just no no so you know more power to anyone feminism is about having choices yeah and if that's your choice i'm not gonna be the one to tell you no but um my grandmother god rest her soul my grandmother on her deathbed made me promise not to have children she goes your sister all your sister wants is kids there's going to be grandkids she goes you have better things to do with your life sweetheart <laughs> that's pretty hilarious so how do i what do i wow I know. I feel kind of bad because then, like, I told my mom that she said that. Oh, God. And my mom was like, yeah, well. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Point taken. All. Got it. Locked up. Locked. Got it. So that's kind of, like, what's up? It seems I mean, the world needs hard. more cool parents and more kids that are raised by artists would be a good thing for the world. Right. But I, I just, I have a hard enough time it's like me and my cat and honestly like we have a hard enough time but I'm kind of with Tracy Emin at, you know she said that thing yeah. there are plenty of great artists who have children they're called men right yeah it's because you know ideally if you're gonna have a kid you're gonna want to do it right like in all seriousness you're gonna want to be a good parent that means full-time you know and or some system in place or getting a nanny which is problematic for feminism in a different way yeah because who's watching the nanny's kids is probably their mother so where's your mother well she's probably running some art center somewhere because that's what fabulous women in their 60s do now and she's got stuff she's not like grandma knitting grandmas don't knit anymore no. grandmas run nonprofits now okay yarn go, bombing go back into high school <laughs> teach or you know right yeah so you know how does that work that whole thing of like bringing other women into your home to do the domestic tasks I, you know if you pay, you know if you pay them fairly it's a job and like any other but it you, you know if you're thinking about feminism at all 
that's not going to be your happy place is right. outsourcing childcare. You know, there's no way, I mean, I, you would need to, and God knows if somehow, God forbid, that, I, that would be the first call I would make is to some kind of nanny, nanny agency or nanny probably. <laughs> but I mean, that is not just an answer. And right. by the way, where's that money coming from? You're trying to make a living with your paintings. So where's, who's paying for that living wage for this other home care worker that yeah. you respect? And who has a family to feed too? Who's paying that? Where where's that money coming from? You're starving artists. So I, all of which is to say, you know, I have a lot of respect and admiration for people who do manage to figure it out because it's hard. I don't think I, I don't think I could. Like I, I truly just, I don't feel like if it happened, I could handle it. I'm superwoman. I don't think I. Could, I really don't think I could do it. Interesting. really satiating to find Rebecca's work or refind it as a new mom. I had viewed this work before, but as a new mom, I found it to be exactly what I was looking for. I felt that the experience is so life-changing and unique. I couldn't believe that there really isn't much visual artwork representing motherhood. Her work is so accurate and yet it's so poetic. This one painting was just like what I needed, you know, and it's the one of the mom holding the baby. Yeah. Yeah, and I got so emotional. <laughs> I get emotional now because it was just like, that's it, you know, yeah. that's what it is. That painting mm -hmm. of uh, the woman with the muddy gloves is uh, very interesting because I showed it to a, a gallery who was coming to basically pick work to show. Mm -hmm. And they were dumbfounded. They just looked at it and they were like, we don't get this painting. We... Uh, it's confusing, it's upsetting, and we're not interested. The three arms one? No, the muddy baby. The muddy baby. Yeah. They simply said, we don't know what you're doing in the studio right now. And, oh gosh, I could cry. Uh, and we'll come back. Makes me want to cry. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, you know, luckily, I turned around and, and, uh, and you know, a friend of mine sold it to a collector the week Good. after. Good. Which is lucky, but what was important was it really, um, I mean, it was very illuminating that I felt like I was articulating this really real and important idea. This may be um, very cynical. Money is a huge factor, mm -hmm. and if you have collectors at the highest level who are women, but they're still buying men's work. It does nothing to change the auction house, the gallery representation. Um, Nicole Hebron's project about the gallery mm -hmm. tally is super mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the most straight ahead fixes for that situation, if galleries think they can sell your work, they will represent you. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, there have to be more women with more money who can buy work I and who agree. are buying women's work. One of the reasons I felt so deeply misunderstood this past year is that I feel like most of the stories about pregnancy and childbirth and being a new mom are male-centric narratives. And they're just so inaccurate. And 
there are small circles of friends and moms, you know, who continually get together to share the true stories of what to expect and what it's like and um, to support each other. But I feel like the stories just aren't enough. Uh, we need the artistic expressions to help us better understand not just what it means to be a mom and what a major physical transformation a person goes through, but to understand what it is to be human. And if these works are not represented within the official gallery system, then they have very little to no chance of ever being in museum collections and art history books. And we need these works in our collective consciousness. There is this kind of institutionalized um, vilification mm -hmm. of, I, I would say, like, in, in the kind of culture that we live in. I would say the most despised person is the middle-aged mother. You know, yeah. she's not an object of sexual desire. She's not an object of, of respect or, or a kind of force of power. Um, it, it's really interesting. I was, uh, I was having this moment personally where I'm 43, right? And I was thinking, I was getting a lot of this like energy. I was absorbing a lot of the cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up one day and I was like, I'm gonna pretend I'm a man today. Simply in my head, uh -huh. in terms of how I think about myself. I was like, I'm 43, three kids. Like all of the same factors that made me feel dead and over and um, and sort of debilitated made me feel empowered. I think it went really well. I think um, rules of engagement as a whole, you know, it was such an interesting concept. Baby Doll is a character who loves love letters. She also loves to bake. She thinks of herself as an equal, but she doesn't feel treated that way. So in her performance piece titled Rules of Engagement, she asks the viewers to respond to one of her questions and help her kind of solve her contemporary problems in exchange for a cupcake. The exchange is a way of trying to give value to her time, her skill, her energy, but she's not trying to start a business and she doesn't quite understand how capitalism is interwined with patriarchy. She just knows that her skills and her energy and her time are undervalued and she wants to give them value. participatory performance piece, Rules of Engagement, each participant is left with a question. Is Baby Doll a cupcake feminist? 
Cupcake feminism is considered to be like a watered-down version of 70s hardcore feminism. But I would argue that cupcake feminism has evolved as a way for women to deal with their reality as they try to accept the type of life that is really possible. And they compare it to the life they envisioned for themselves as young ladies born after the feminist revolution. An example of a cupcake feminist is a woman who has a college degree and had aspirations of having a career but dropped that dream when she found it too difficult to balance a life with kids, work, family, the wage gap, and an environment that is pretty hostile towards women. I think cupcake feminists believe in equality, but revert back to traditional gender roles as a survival mechanism. It's a lot of work to pave a path that's different from what's expected. Baby Doll emerged as a protest she's a reactionary character it's a way of saying this is the alternative to me as a whole and complete person baby doll is what we get if we keep imposing these limitations and expectations